Hey, this is a video for 6.3, Fuel Types and Uses. So go ahead and check out the overview and set up your guided notes. So wood and charcoal uh, are forms of biomass that are used as energy sources around the world. Uh, wood is the leading energy source. Between two and three million people use it globally. Charcoal is more energy dense and charcoal is just basically it's wood that's been heated under a very low oxygen content in order to remove the water and to remove a lot of the volatile compounds that are found within it. Uh, you've definitely used charcoal. Uh, you've had charcoal, you know, if you had a summer barbecue, very likely. Uh, but both of these are a little bit dangerous and need to be watched out because they can release particulate matter. Particulate matter is like the ash and the soot that comes when you burn this. And if it's done indoors, which it is a lot for cooking in some countries, if it's done indoors, you need to have exhaust because this particulate matter can, can damage the respiratory system and lead to other illnesses, which we'll talk about in future videos. Now, formation of coal involves hundreds of millions of years. The coal that we have on this planet, remember it's a non-renewable resource. It developed 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous era or period. You don't have to know that. But it, it formed because the wood in the trees was not able to be decomposed and basically it got compressed. So when you're forming coal, essentially what you're trying to do is form like pure forms of carbon. So this process takes a long time. The first stage uh, will form peat, and peat is formed under anaerobic conditions. It is under acidic conditions as well. And again, it is the partial decay of vegetation. Now peat has a low heat content. So if you burn it, it's not going to burn as hot as coal. So it has a relatively low heat content and a relatively low sulfur content. Sulfur is, a, is an issue because sulfur can lead, when it, when it gets into the atmosphere, can contribute to acid precipitation. We'll be discussing this a lot, but with the coal, you should definitely understand the heat content and the sulfur content. The next stage is lignite, and lignite is often called brown coal. Lignite has a low heat content and also a low sulfur content. Lignite is typically used for generation of electricity. So it has a lower, now this is not low, like it's very low, but it's lower than other forms. So the electricity that we generate in, at least in the United States and around the world is predominantly done through lignite. Lignite is more plentiful, but it is not a pure form of carbon. There are definitely other pollutants present. Then if it sits around and, and gets compressed even more, you can get bituminous coal. And bituminous coal has a high heat content, very high heat content, and a low sulfur content. Now, this is done predominantly for manufacturing, uh, for making different forms uh, like steel production. Uh, this form of coal uh, is as we get into the more advanced forms of coal or the long, or, you know, the more carbon dense forms of coal, they're not as uh, common and the reserves are much lower. So if we let it sit around and, and condense even more, you will get the most pure form of coal and that is anthracite. Anthracite is, uh, you know, quite, it's not as prevalent around the world anymore. Uh, but it has a very high heat content, but also a very high sulfur content. So we don't want to use this in industry or in large scale. So it's done predominantly for smaller heating, like home heating and menu or, and, uh, those types of capabilities. Now, petroleum, petroleum is formed from phytoplankton in the ocean. The way that you can remember it is coal is formed from plants. Coal is a solid, plants are a solid. Phytoplankton are found in the ocean and petroleum or oil is liquid. So you had prehistoric phytoplankton that are found floating around in these ancient oceans. Eventually they will die and sink to the bottom and then get covered by sediments in the ocean. Over many, many years, millions of years, 
it will build up. So this would represent the area of sediments on top. And it's going to form in this porous rock. So this rock is porous under immense amounts of pressure. So this pressure is not only under the ocean, but it's also under uh, many layers of rocks. And then eventually the petroleum is going to rise through any this porous rock and it's going to collect in these reservoirs. So if you notice the, the petroleum that is forming is rising up to these reservoirs up here and this is where we would collect it from. So when we get this petroleum it is in a form we call crude oil and you heat it and you're separating, you're distilling the petroleum into different components. Um, by the differences in the boiling point. So as you heat it up, the ones with the lower boiling point will be collected first. So they'll boil off first, like for example, petroleum gas, and then you'll get gasoline. You don't have to know these, these orders. This is just me giving you the information. Uh, you'll have this naphtha, which is used in manufacturing plastic. All plastic comes from, well, not all plastic, um, but pr plastic predominantly comes from petroleum. We can also make it from other sources as well, but historically it's been made from petroleum. Then we can get paraffin, and paraffin is like related to like the waxy type of substances. We can have diesel, then fuel oil for heating, and then we can have lubricating oil, and finally bitumen. And this has the highest boiling point. Now, this will be refined for future use. We can also produce asphalt and tar, things that we're using for our roads. We can, use, we can refine it into diesel fuel, refine it into gasoline, refine it into kerosene, which you would use for lamps, and again, refine it into plastic. So all of these products come from, originally come from crude oil or petroleum. Now, natural gas also forms around petroleum. And if you look right here, this would be where the petroleum forms. We're always going to have a shale source, and this is the rock on the bottom. And then you're going to have something like sandstone or something that is porous. And then you're going to have a shale capstone. So you have the, the source on the bottom. This is where all the phytoplankton basically accumulated, and then it's covered by other layers and then it rises up into this reservoir and the shale cap the thing you got to remember is it is non-porous so this petroleum can't rise any further if it could rise further it would come up to the ground so we dig this well down here and we get our petroleum but in the petroleum oftentimes we're going to have natural gas and this is the methane that rises up uh, on top of the petroleum. So it is a gas, so it's actually going to be more buoyant than the liquid petroleum. Now, this isn't always the case, but this is very uh, often the case. So natural gas will typically be associated with petroleum deposits. It does have, methane has a 25, 24 time uh, more warming potential than carbon dioxide, so it is a much more serious greenhouse gas. Uh, it only produces half as much as carbon dioxide as coal, so it's much cleaner. And also there are very little pollutants, little sulfur dioxide, little nitrogen oxides. We'll talk about this in future videos, but no mercury whatsoever. So that is a good thing because these will all contribute to different types of air pollution. Now we also can find uh, petroleum in tar sands and tar sands is just where you have this thick uh, viscous substance called bitumen. Bitumen is just petroleum that's in the soil so it's stuck to the sand and the clay particles. Now it's very heavily attached so sometimes you can get it from open pit mining and that's if it's near the surface. If that's the case um, you have to process it elsewhere and then you're going to be transporting this bitumen. So you can think about all of the uh, environmental impacts that are associated with transportation, that are associated with the processing. So there will probably be some pollutants released and there could be some potential contamination from spills. Now, you can also get water pollution because you can have acid mine drainage from a um, from this pit mining after it has been 
abandon. So if it's not treated properly and it rains, you can have acid mine drainage, which can lead to water pollution. Now you can also have what is called in situ mining. That's like just basically on site. And that is if it is much deeper underground. But if that happens, you can get water pollution because you're extracting it with steam. You're basically shooting this superheated steam down underground and you're basically melting this, uh, this petroleum and helping to remove it from the sand that is closely uh, bonded to. So there is uh, a term called cogeneration and cogeneration is when you have the production of uh, energy. So you're taking this fuel source, you're converting it into electricity, but cogeneration is when you have the waste heat is used to heat a building. That's it. Okay, cogeneration, you're using the waste heat to heat a building. So you're not just generating electricity, you're also using the waste, either the wastewater to heat a building or the waste heat that is generated is, is pumped into a building for heating. Okay, that will come up. You will see this word a lot and you will have to know this. What I would like you to do is respond to this check for understanding. And finally, for our FRQ practice, describe how cogeneration could be utilized at a manufacturing facility. I hope that this video was informative. I thank you for your attention, and I will see you soon.